All right, let's begin with a word of prayer, as always. I hope you all had a um, good week last week. Welcome to Katy Community Church. I guess I should say that first. Let's pray, uh, as always. This gives us the opportunity to examine ourselves, make sure that we're in fellowship with God, and prepared for the teaching of his word today. The way we do this, as you know, is using the rebound technique, which is based on 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to be able to meet together in this manner and study your word together. Thank you for the faithfulness of those who are here today. Pray that you'll help each one of us today as we continue our study on undeserved suffering. Help us with our understanding and help us with our application to our individual lives that we may continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen. This is lesson number five, the doctrine of undeserved suffering. We've been looking at it from the standpoint of Paul's writing in the book of Romans. Up to this point, he has uh, talked about the suffering uh, of the creation, the suffering of uh, or groaning of the uh, advancing believer, and then finally the groaning of the Holy Spirit. We looked at those last week. We uh, we took a look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and uh, today we want to take a look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, beginning there, 29 and 30. Important verses because they have a lot of doctrine in them, and uh, Romans 28, as you remember, says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Then Paul goes on to say, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, it's important that we understand these doctrines because there's a lot of false doctrine out there. It has been for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And uh, we want to make sure that we get it accurately as to what these mean, these doctrines of predestination and foreknowledge uh, and even election that we will see in the next verse. So the entire doctrine of undeserved suffering, why is that here? Why is that part of Paul's teaching here? Well, the doctrine of undeserved suffering looks back, or excuse me, looks into the future when believers receive their glorified bodies where there's no longer suffering. Now, Paul is going to look back at these things in verse 31, which he says, and what shall we say to uh, these things? Well, we'll get into that in our next lesson. But you can see what Paul's doing. He's looking at the future, the end of the future, with a personal sense of destiny. And understanding these doctrines has an impact on that. Because if you understand the doctrine of foreknowledge, predestination, election, justification, and glorification, which are all points he brings up in these verses, then that will give you a personal sense of destiny. And a personal sense of destiny gives us a longing for heaven and the rewards and blessings that await, which is our ultimate victory in Christ. So let's talk about it. Foreknowledge, what does that mean? Foreknowledge means to know beforehand. <laughs> Real simple. 
or to know in advance. So how does it apply to God and what he has done? Foreknowledge, number one, let's take the negative. Foreknowledge does not mean that God predetermines beforehand that what human being will choose to believe or not believe or what a human being will do or not do. God has given us all free will to make those choices for ourselves. God never forces a decision or an action upon any person. He leaves that strictly up to them. That's all part of the resolution of the angelic conflict, as we know. So it simply means that God is omniscient. He knows ahead of time every decision that we will make. And a good illustration of this, it, it doesn't mean how he, that he makes it happen, okay? Just because you know something ahead of time doesn't mean that you are the cause of what happens. The illustration that I like to use is a solar eclipse. Scientists can tell us exactly what time an eclipse will occur. We can go outside and we wear those little dark glasses. We can look up there and look at it. But they don't make it happen. So they have foreknowledge. They know beforehand what's going to happen. They didn't make it happen, but they knew it was going to happen. God knows perfectly, eternally, and simultaneously all that is knowable, whether it is actual or, pos uh, or possible. <laughs> In other words, he knows every thought, motive, decision, or action that we have ever made or will made or uh, are going to make in the future. He even knows the possibilities if our decision is different from the one that we actually decided upon. Because God is all knowing. He's eternal. He has eternal knowledge. God is truth and his knowledge is totally and perfectly accurate. And since God has always existed, his knowledge has always existed with him. Therefore, he knows perfectly and simultaneously everything that has occurred or will ever occur. And there are three factors of divine knowledge. According to Acts, 20, or Acts chapter 15, verse 18, it is eternal. According to Romans eleven thirty three, it is incomprehensible. The finite mind of man cannot comprehend the fact that God has ex always existed. There's never, there's not a beginning when God began. He's always existed. He's always known everything that will occur or could possibly occur. And the third, according to Ephesians 3.10, it is wise. It is God's wisdom. So to God, the future is just as clear as the past. To us, the future, unless we have that information, is not that clear to us. It's somewhat clear. We know from God's word future events, but you don't know what's going to happen to you this afternoon, tomorrow, the next day. There's always four unforeseen things. God already knows all that. That's what foreknowledge is. So when it says, for those who he foreknew, he knew you ahead of time. He knew you from eternity past. And he knew exactly what your decision was going to be. He knew that you were going to believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. He didn't make you. You still made the choice on your own, but God knew it. He foreknows the future, but it is not predetermination. He did not predetermine that you would believe in Jesus Christ. He knew it, but he didn't predetermine it. See how difficult this can be to get your head around? See how incomprehensible God is? 
He doesn't interfere with your volition. God foreknows what the choices of everyone will be. He may attempt to influence their choices by gracious guidance through Bible doctrine or through the uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't coerce a decision out of anyone. And I've given you a bunch of verses there that you can look up on your own if you want to study a little bit more about that. Paul goes on to say, he also predestined us. Predestined us to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, the Greek word for predestined is prorizo, P-R-O-O-I-R-I-Z-O. Pro means before. Prorizo means to mark or to design. So what does that word predestined mean? Well, you take those two words and you put them together. They mean to determine or to design beforehand. And what is it that God predetermined or predesigned? Well, we know from his word that God does not decide ahead of time who will believe in Christ and who will reject him. He knows, but he didn't predetermine that. He also didn't predetermine who will live their spiritual life. That, once again, is a free will decision that every believer has to make on their own. So what is predetermined? God predetermined or predesigned a perfect plan for every believer in eternity past. That includes you. That includes me. God decided that anyone who believed in Christ would receive 40 spiritual assets and even greater blessings for those who respond to him and respond to his word by studying his word and applying his word to their life. This plan was predetermined by God for a believer's maximum happiness. In other words, God planned based on his omniscience based on his foreknowledge that you would believe he was able to formulate a plan for you, pre-design a plan for you before you ever believed. But he didn't make you believe. So a person enters the plan of God the moment they believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. And after salvation, believers may or may not continue in God's plan. In either case, God does not predetermine who will or will not believe or who will or will not execute his plan. The plan is there. Every believer has a plan. But every believer does not live that plan. They do not fulfill that plan. That's why at the judgment seat of Christ, that when rewards are given out to believers, there are going to be different levels of rewards. Some believers are going to receive greater rewards than other believers. All believers are going to have eternal life. They already do. All believers are going to be happy and content for all eternity. But there are going to be degrees of rewards in heaven. So God designed a perfect plan for you. That's what is predestined or predetermined or predesigned. Keep those words in your mind. You'll understand this doctrine. And he makes it very clear here, Paul does. He says, what was he predesigned? To be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Talking about a resurrection body. So it's a reference to our ultimate sanctification. Now, what does ultimate sanctification have to do with undeserved suffering? 
Well, we've already stated that if you understand ultimate sanctification. First of all, what does the word sanctification mean? It means to be set apart to God, right? For, for Christian, it means to be set apart to God. Ultimate means the final. It's the final sanctification. There's positional sanctification where we're set apart at salvation. There is experiential sanctification where we're set apart while we're here on this earth, if we allow God the Holy Spirit to do that. And finally, there's ultimate sanctification where we receive our resurrection body. So what does it have to do with undeserved suffering? It's a personal sense of destiny. When you realize that you're going to live forever in a perfect glorified body like Christ has at this very moment, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, that should cause you to be able to handle any undeserved suffering that comes into your life and give you a longing for heaven. If you're living your life with tunnel vision based on what's going on in Satan's world system, then you're going to be a miserable Christian. If you are living your life based on eternity, in the light of eternity, based on what is going to happen for you in the future, tomorrow, the next day, the following day, next month, next year, and on into eternity, and you're trusting God for the results of all of that, and you understand that you are going to receive a resurrection body, whether you want one or not, if you're a Christian, if you have personally believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are going to live for all eternity in a resurrection body. Now, there's a lot of folks out there who perhaps were called themselves Christians when they were younger, and perhaps they were. Perhaps they believed in Jesus Christ at a very young age. But as time went by, they slipped into a state of reversionism and rejected what they believed as a child and now have become, some of them even call themselves atheists. But guess what? Even those people who call themselves atheists at later in life, but at an early age, place their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, they're going to be in heaven. I think we're going to be shocked at a lot of the people that are in heaven. They may be shocked that we're there. But the fact is, it has nothing to do with your lifestyle before or after salvation. It has to do with that one decision that you make to believe in Jesus Christ as your personal savior. So when you do that, you have the opportunity to become conformed to the image of God's son. So this knowledge gives us great confidence in the future and what awaits us as advancing believers. Jesus Christ in his resurrection body, right, is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Why is he the firstborn? Because he is the first to receive a resurrection body. He's the first to rise from the dead and never to die again. There were people in the Bible, as you well know, that were raised from the dead. Classic example is Christ's friend, Lazarus. He was raised from the dead. Mary and Martha's brother, if you recall the story. But ultimately, he died. Again, Christ rose never to die again. You see the difference? That's why he has a resurrection body. Lazarus had to wait until he died the second time, if you want to call what he did dying or resurrection, really resuscitation to be technical, but Jesus is the first one to be born, never to die again. And being 
The firstborn means Christ is the ruler of the church. He is our high priest. He is the ruler not only of the church, he's a ruler of Israel as a descendant of David's royal family. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. 